أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إنما الأعمال بالنيا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Before beginning, I always like to share a hadith which is great motivation for us to always make an effort to come to circles of knowledge We know the Prophet has told us that anytime a people come together for the sole intention of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the angels descend upon them, shrouding them with mercy, and that no one gets up from that gathering except that all of their sins are forgiven. So we begin by saying, Rabbana taqabbal minna. Oh Allah, accept this effort from us. And the notations on that hadith indicate that even if you fall asleep, you still get the reward. So if you fall asleep right now, don't feel bad, it's okay. I'll, my job is to make sure you stay awake. But if you had a rough work week, you want to go in the back and put your head, inshallah, when you wake up for dinner, all your sins will be wiped away. No problem, inshallah. So let's begin. We're going to be talking about the life of Imam Nawawi, inshallah. Imam Nawawi is a name which, by the end of this talk, will be more motivated to be like him, inshallah. And he will be, if he's not already a household name, then you will be motivated to make sure that your children, as soon as they can walk and talk and speak, that it's a name that they know. And it's a name that they're very much familiar with. So we're going to break up this talk into talking about his background, um, how he got to where he did, uh, his ilm, and then inshallah we will talk about another aspect of his life which many of us may not know about. So the backstory of Imam an -Nawawi. First of all, why do we take the time to study the biography of scholars? When we study them, we learn from their behavior and from their actions. And it can be a great motivation for us. When we study the lives of the people of the past, the great imams, the great scholars, it's a purification for us. It is a way for us to see that this is something that I can achieve. They are human just like me. They demonstrate to us as Muslims that this very same Quran and the very same book of Hadith, look at what it inspired. Look at how it motivated them. And Imam Nawawi in particular is one... Let me, actually, I skipped ahead. Imam Nawawi, he shows us that he was able to uh, look past the temptations of daily life. He is not someone who was a Sahaba. He's not someone who is a Tabi'i, but rather he lived 600 years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was born pretty much exactly around that time, about 600 years after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. So first and foremost, what year did the Prophet ﷺ die? Common era? Who can tell me? What year was the departure of the Prophet ﷺ? So I don't know, because I have to do the math. What year was he born? Let's start there. 570. Okay. How long, and when did he receive prophethood? At the age of 40. 6, 10. How long did he live? How long was he a prophet? 23 years. So 6, 10 plus 23? 6, 33. So if you just remember the year the prophet was born, 570. If it was halal to get tattoos, I would say everyone get 570, right? But it's not, it's not halal. But 570, then you can add his age. 40 is when he started prophethood. That brings you to 610. Then he was a prophet for 23 years, so he passed away 633. So 572, 633. So 1233 is around the time that Imam Nawawi was born. And this is what the Islamic world looked like around that time. Side note, all of the great expansion you see here, it happened in the first hundred years of Islam. Everything you see here happened in the first hundred years of Islam. Defeating the Romans, defeating the Persians, having weapons that were, that were inferior to these grand, uh, these grand nations. But what is it that granted them the victory? If it wasn't the weaponry, it was the taqwa. And this is just a side point for you to ponder and think about that there's no expansion beyond this after the first hundred years of Islam. Even though there was much more wealth in the ummah, much greater technology, nothing beyond this. So all the barakah of the expansion of the Muslim lands, it actually came from the very first hundred years of Islam. Now Imam Nawawi in particular is one that we really want to study because he lived in a time when it was very difficult. He lived in a time when you had a crazy guy named Putin in the East and another crazy guy named Trump in the West. Okay, not quite. But just, just to give you the relation. 
he, ha he lived in a time when the Mongols were invading from the east and the Crusaders were invading from the west and they had already taken over portions of, of northern Sham. So he lived in a very difficult time. And this for us is, is, is an inspiration that even in times of difficulty, you can be a beacon of light. When the difficulty is there, we don't sit back and relax. That's the time to actually be more motivated to do more good in the society. And so we come to a question. When times are difficult, should everyone just stop what they're doing? And the only thing to do then is join an army and fight? What do you guys think? Should Islamic studies stop because there's fighting going on? Why no? What do you guys say no for why? Yes. I like that. He took what I said in the first part and he used it already. <laughs> MashaAllah. Yes. But why else? Why else? Because it would be a catastrophe for knowledge to just come to an end. If we just sit down and wait for peace and then we start studying and reading books, then we'll never progress in our knowledge and we'll fall way behind. So the knowledge always has to continue. We need people dedicated to fighting and defending, but we also need our scholars more than anything else. So the knowledge should never, ever stop. Over here I worked really hard and I got you a picture of Imam Nawawi. So he was born in about 631 in the village of Nawa. And he was not born to a prestigious family. It was not a family that was well known, but one that was actually rather modest. His father wasn't a big sheikh, wasn't a big scholar, he owned a farm. And, he was, and his father was known for his taqwa and for his simplicity. And he was not from a family of scholars either. There's a reason why I have his picture here, we'll come to that later on inshallah. Who is, the, is that a picture of? That's Malcolm X, good. So, but there's a reason why I put that there, you'll find out later inshallah. So his full name is Abu Zakariya Muhyiddin Yahya Ibn Sharif al Nawawi. Or sometimes just when he would write his letters, when he would write his letters, he would say Yahya. So the emergence of an Imam. Now we're going to talk about his knowledge. First of all, the title Imam, this is the most prestigious title. Not Sheikh, not Mufti, not Maulana, Imam. Because Imam means you don't only have knowledge, but you're capable of leading the people out of darkness. So this is the greatest title a person can be given. This is why when we say Imam, we don't, hear, we don't think of a thousand names. We only think of Imam Nawawi, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Ashafi. Only a handful of names come to mind. So this title Imam, we need to bring it back to its standard. I wanted to share um, a, a job description, which I couldn't find it at the moment. But there was a job description for the last Imam that was hired in the Ottoman Empire. And his job description, if you read it, it's amazing. Of course, he's grounded in Arabic, he's grounded in Quran, he's grounded in Hadith. But among the job requirements is that he also has to be fluent in Latin. And he has to be fluent in how to rebuke uh, Christianity using Islam, and Judaism using Islam, and how you can rebuke uh, uh, Judaism with Christianity. And Christianity with, they wanted everything covered. From every single angle, he should be able to talk about these three religions. He had to be uh, skilled in mathematics and physics. He had to be physically strong. He had to be skilled in archery and swimming. You have all of these requirements. I can't remember all of them, unfortunately. But this is the standard which we need to get back to, inshallah. The young students, the young brothers and sisters, we need to realize that we come from a tradition that have a very high standard of knowledge. And part of us coming here tonight and looking at this imam is to re-motivate us to be dedicated to seeking knowledge, but also having an impact in the society. So from a young age, Imam Anawi, he loved reciting Quran. And he hated to be away from reading the Quran and from studying. And there was a famous incident where the children, they forced him to play and he cried as a result. He cried because he was taken away from that which he loved the most, which was the Quran. This is the childhood of Imam Nawawi. This is the natural love that he had for the Quran and for seeking knowledge. And so as soon as he was old enough, as soon as he was 18 years old, he left his home and he traveled north, 100 kilometers, about 70 miles to Damascus to study. And because he came from a poor family, he didn't go with any plans of residence. Nowadays, you 18, you apply to college, you set up your room and board. He just knew where he was going to school. He didn't know where he was sleeping. And so he would just sleep anywhere randomly. He basically went and he was homeless, but he went for the knowledge to get to, 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 to increase in his knowledge. That was his number one focus. And before he went, he had already memorized major books in Shafi Fiqh. So he went there ahead of the game, ready to go. Imam Nawawi, his dorm room was described as packed with books. And that when people would come and visit, they had no place to sit. And if they wanted to come in, they had to move books to the side. They had to stack up books and make it into a chair. There was no room to walk. 
And so this is what he spent his time in doing. This is a idea, this is a typical uh, sophomore schedule in college. What typically when people go to college, how many classes do they take? How many classes? About five. If you're really smart, you might do six or seven. Imam Nawi took 12 classes a day. And it was the same deal. You know in college the rule. If you sit in lecture for one hour, how many hours do you spend back in your, in your home studying? Three. It's supposed to be a three to one ratio. Right? That's how you succeed, succeed in college. You spend one hour in lecture, you spend three hours going over the notes, then you do really well. So Imam Nawawi, he would go to 12 classes a day, and then he would push himself when he went back home to spend one hour per class reviewing. So how many hours is that? How many hours is that? 12 plus 12. 24. So what's going on? <laughs> He's not sleeping. So Imam Nawawi, this is how he used to fall asleep. He would fall asleep with his head in the book. And he told us, he said, he said, I spent two years without lying on the ground to sleep. Meaning what? He's sitting at his chair until, and, he, and he's reading the books and he's falling asleep and he's probably slapping himself, he's forcing himself, he's forcing himself until eventually his, his head just falls in the book. He said, I studied for two years like this. If you study for two years like this, how much knowledge are you going to have? This is how much knowledge you're going to have. We're going to see what he does later on in his life. So he would complete in one day, what would take a normal person, two days. So when he studies two years in college, it's like the other person studied four years, or even more. And he said he studied in this manner actually for about six years, where he would take classes nonstop and he would study nonstop. He had no time for anything else. This is why he never got married. Imam Nawawi was one of the few Imams who never got married. There are others like Ibn Taymiyyah and Sayyid Qutb. His life was dedicated to knowledge. And he was filled with the desire only to learn. So some people, they start to discuss, okay, why didn't he get married? Some say it's because he didn't have the time. He just spent all his time studying. He's not even interested. Others say he didn't have the means. He didn't have the, the money to go and get married. And so they make different statements. Others say, you know, due to his piety, he was scared of Allah. And he actually told us, and here's a quote from him. He said, I feared that I might follow one sunnah. As you know, marriage is a big sunnah. He said, I feared that I may follow one sunnah and thereby get involved in many forbidden acts. So I might marry a woman, but then I do more harm to her than good. So now what have I done? I've created a whole stack of sins for myself. So he knew he didn't have the time, he didn't have the interest, he didn't, have, he didn't want to do more dhulm, nor harm than good. And so this is what his explanation was. On this note, I wanted to share something that he said, which is remarkable about women. And this is going to get me in trouble with the brothers, but... Maybe that's why I don't come here too often. <laughs> no, but I'm going to share a quote from Imam Nawawi. And this is his description of women. Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah, he said, It is all parts of goodness and kindness that people follow. This is where the woman serves her husband in those things that she mentioned, that she mentioned such as preparing food, cooking, washing, clothing, and so forth. This is all voluntary work on the parts of the woman towards her husband and her good dealings with him. These are all good acts on her part. None of that is obligatory upon her. If she refused to do any or all of that, she would not be sin sinful. In fact, he must, he must do those jobs for her, and it is not permissible for him to force her to do any of them. This is what the women does on a voluntary basis only. It is a beautiful custom that women have been following for centuries. And there's only two things that are obligatory upon a woman. So he's speaking as a faqih. There's only two things that are obligatory. One is keeping herself ready for her husband, and the other is staying in the house. And when it comes to these two things, you know that can't be forced anyway. You can't force your wife to stay home, and you can't force her to you know, answer your call. These things you have to do in a, in a proper way anyway. So what is he saying? He's saying he's done his analysis of the deen, and he doesn't find any requirement from the Qur'an, from the hadith, or anything that women have to do these things, but rather they do them voluntarily. And so when he looks at the plate, he says, all of the requirements are on me. I have to feed her, I have to clothe her. The scholars later on said you have to clothe her the same way other women are being clothed. You have to give her everything she needs so she's comfortable. So all these requirements are on me. I might not be able to fulfill all these expectations. It's better I stay single. This is the approach and, and the philosophy of Imam Nawawi when it comes to marriage. So his book, Imam Nawawi's book, The 40 Hadith. If you type in in Google, 40 Hadith, and I did this morning just to make sure. You type in 40 hadith and you hit enter. Everything that comes up is Imam Nawawi. 
And you scroll down, actually, I scroll down, and like the 10th link on Google, it said Bangla Hadith. And I just wanted to make sure. So I clicked on it, and what was it? A Bangladeshi version of the 40 Hadith of Imam Nawawi. So the 40 Hadith of Imam Nawawi, it is the most popular Hadith collection on the planet. Even though he lived back in 1233, 700 years ago, no one has come with a book as reputable as him. And it is an important fact that we know that there are thousands of scholars who compiled 40 hadith books. Thousands. So the question comes now, why is his book famous? Why is it when you go into Google and type his name, it's the first one that comes up? Why is it when you go to Amazon and type in 40 hadith, it's the first one that comes up? Did he speak to the great-great-grandfather of the, of the owner of Amazon and say, hey, I want an exclusive here? Anyone types in 40 hadith, is going to be my book? Why is this happening? And by the way, the answer to this question is the same answer to the question, why is it when you type in Muwatta, what comes up is the Muwatta of Imam Malik. And there are thousands of scholars that wrote Muwatta, different collections of hadith. But the only Muwatta that's known is the Muwatta of Imam Malik. So the question I ask you is, why is it that his book is the most famous book? What are your theories? You can't answer because we talked about this already. He's in my class with other stuff, so you can't answer. Why is his book the most famous? Why aren't there three famous books on, on, on 40 hadith? Why Imam Nawawi? What do you guys think? There's no wrong answer. What do you think? What do you think? You can even, you can, you can say something outlandish, it's okay. Most authentic? People knew, it, knew the deal on authenticity. There's no explanation, it's just hadith that's, that's, that's put together. If you, you open it, it's just hadith. That's it. There's no explanation. There's no commentary. People order, Allahu Allah, maybe. Maybe you just hit people that way. There's one dominant opinion that the scholars have, and you guys, I'm sure you can figure it out. So did he pay someone off? No. Did he have government support? Like the government said, this is the standard book, and that's it. Like a Hanafi fiqh. That's why Hanafi fiqh is so popular, right? Because the Ottoman Empire, the largest empire said, we're going to be Hanafi. That's why everyone's Hanafi, right? If the Ottoman Empire chose Hanbali fiqh, we'd all be Hanbali right now, right? Government sponsorship. So it wasn't that. So what was it? It's something intangible. I'll give you a hint. It's not tangible. The reason. It's not something academic. Part of his love for the Quran, yes. You're getting there. Getting there. What's the first hadith in the, in the uh, collection of Amnawi? Okay, so what does that tell us? He had a pure intention. Sincerity. He was sincere. And that is why 700 years later, we still talk about him. And 700 years later, you walk into any bookstore, you will find a collection of Imam Nawawi. And most likely in all of your homes, you have a copy of Imam Nawawi's 40 Hadith, or his Riyadh Salihin. This is why his name is still present today. You have people that have a lot of money, a lot of wealth, a lot of children. But what's the legacy? That's, what, what is it that's going to leave a person a legacy? It's their sincerity. If they do it purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, the, 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 and, and of course his collection starts with in the mal'a'malu bin niyyah. That actions are based on intention. So he had the pure niyyah that this is purely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That I, this is my contribution to the deen. That these are the 40 hadith I think if someone studies, they have a comprehensive understanding of the deen. And so for that reason and many more, we have his book today. His book is very unique. He did something that was not done before him. He would mention the strength of the hadith, whether it was strong or it was weak, and he would mention the narrator's name. This is something that he initiated. And everyone that followed after him, they're following his legacy as well. So he brought this to the forefront, that we should know where the hadith came from, who the chain of narrators are. He introduced this idea and this concept. Over here is a, is a diagram of what a chain of narrators come from. So just so you, just so you can follow, uh, you have on the very top the Prophet ﷺ. Then in this case you have uh, Ubay, one of the companions. Then the Tabi'een that related, there were three that heard the Hadith from him. Then from there and so forth. And eventually all of these people who heard from this person, heard from this person, it trickles down and you have the narration existing in the Musnad of, of Imam Ahmad or Sunan Abu Dawood or Sunan al nasai So this is something that he made popular. It's making sure you know who the narrator is. And he also spoke in a way that's honest and that, that gave him academic credibility. This is a statement directly from him. And he said that he was asked about the grading of hadith and why do they vary. 
And he said, he said that what constitutes trustworthiness and, re and reliability in memory is a rational character assessment. So when it comes to scholars that are scholars of hadith, they assess a person, is this person trustworthy? Can I take hadith from them? And so on and so forth. He's making it very open that listen, this is based on, a, on subjectivity. He's making it very clear. And this is important for us as Muslims because when we stand up and say, I know that these are the words of the Prophet Sallam, it's because of people like this, that we're honest in the approach. But you know what? It's not an exact science, but we do the best we can. And so we have this concept of mutawatir and, and so on and so forth that we know when we, when we have without a doubt knowing that these are the words of the Prophet So he opened up this discussion on the grading of hadith and made it very, very popular. He, did many, he wrote many, many books. These are the top four popular books that he wrote. Uh, other, than, other than the 40 hadith, he also wrote a commentary on Sahih Muslim. Uh, Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani, he wrote a commentary on Sahih Bukhari, another great scholar. Imam Nawi wrote a commentary on Sahih Muslim. And the scholars say that once you have these two commentaries, you don't need any other commentary. So he wrote an 18-volume commentary on Sahih Muslim. In addition, he wrote fiqh books like Rauda and Majmu. And of course, he has Riyadh al-Salihin, which is a wonderful book. If he had only wrote Riyadh al-Salihin, we would have said, what an amazing man. You know Riyadh al-Salihin. You take a topic, Sabr. You go to Sabr. What do you do? You find verses on Sabr and you find Hadith on Sabr. And now you as, a, you as a simple Muslim, us as simple Muslims, we can just take it and study Sabr now. And now we know Sabr from the Quran and Sabr. He compiled that book for us. He put it together so we can study these topics with the direct sources. He wrote many, many other books. We can't, go, we can't list all of them here, but let me just maybe read quickly. He wrote books on the principles of fiqh, usul, the methodology. He wrote books on hajj. He wrote books on fiqh in general. He wrote books on adhkar, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He wrote books on the etiquette of reading the Quran. He wrote inspirational works to motivate people. He wrote lexical works, so he was into grammar. He wrote books on, uh, on the science of hadith. And, and then he also went further and wrote abridged versions of his previous books, so it would be easier for people to, to get the knowledge and it would be disseminated. He wrote so many books. I know he wrote a comment, and not, to, and not just that he wrote many books, but he had an amazing writing, writing style. A scholar said that a Nawi, he wrote about various topics, and his writings were distinguished by their clarity, easy expression, pleasurable wordings. When he gave a topic a thorough treatment, he would not leave, de he would not leave any detail behind, narration or important points out. If he dealt with something in an abridged manner, he would bring out what was interesting and wonderful. So he's a, he's a, he's a person we should look to when you're writing. Writing is a very important skill. It's the reason why every exam every year, you have to you know, take literary exams and what are they called now? I don't, they used to be called RCT when I was in, in school. What is it called now? What is it called? You're writing, you're writing exams you have to take every year in, in junior high school and high school. No name anymore? Don't they have like a standard that they make you take? ELA? Okay, so they still have them. This is why. Writing is very, very important. And so he wasn't just a prolific writer, but he was an eloquent writer, and he wrote in a way that was pleasing. And it was interesting to people. So really make sure you can write well. Later on in life when you get a job, you have to know how to write emails effectively. You know, it's a very important skill, knowing how to write. Imam Nawi, he wrote at least 50 books. He started writing books at the age of 32 until the age of 44. So he wrote for 12 years. If you took all the books that he wrote, do you know how much it would amount to on a daily basis? If you took all the books he wrote, you're, I know you know. I told you before. I know you know. If you take all his books and you divided it by those days over those 12 years, it would be the equivalent of a full notebook. You know one subject notebook? What, 80 pages? It's like writing 80 pages a day. And he said he used to write and write and write till his hand hurt and he would still write more. Have you guys ever had to do that? You have to write and your hands like hurting and you're like holding your hand and then just going at it. He did that every single day. Every single day he did that. And so that's how he wrote all these books. So again, he accomplished things that no one after him, or very few after him, were able to accomplish. I'll skip this point for the sake of time. So he was a great teacher, he was a great jurist. People would come to him if they had any types of fit questions. And this is one part of his life. There's two other parts of his life. The second part of his life is he was an ascetic. An ascetic is someone who, as he says, as he, as he mentions the hadith, the brother Prophet says, كُنْ فِي الدُّنْيَا كَأَنَّكَ غَرِيبٌ أَوْ عَابِرُ السَّبِيلٌ so he, don't, he didn't only compile these book of hadith, but he lived them. What does this hadith mean? The Prophet tells us to dunya, live in the world as if you're a stranger or a traveler. And this is exactly the way he lived. Imam Nawawi, he had one turban. He had one long gown. 
he would eat simple food and he would be careful where he ate from. He refused to eat any of the fruits of Damascus. He was from Nawa and he traveled 100 miles to Damascus. In Damascus, he refused to eat any of the fruits from the city. Why? Because the farmers there were using a methodology which there was difference of opinion on whether or not that farming methodology was halal or haram, which was sharecropping. There was difference of opinion. Because of that ikhtilaf, he said, I'm going to restrain myself. So he didn't eat any of the fruits from Damascus. He chose a simple life, although he could have been rich. Scholars can make a lot of money. And we know that nowadays more than anything else. Scholars can make a lot of money. But he did not, choose, he did not want to live that life. Rather, he lived in the service of his students. He would be the one serving them food. He would be the one looking after them. And he would fast perpetually. Again, he has no time to eat. He's taking 12 classes a day, and then he's going home and trying to review all his notes. He has barely any time to eat. He would just drink water in the morning and then something small at night. And that's it. That's every single day for Imam Nawawi. And he didn't accept any stipend. As a teacher in the university, he could have received, uh, he could have received the salary. and It would have been an honest salary. He only took salary for the first two years. And why did he take the salary? Because he wanted to get a nice car. Because he wanted to get some nice stoves. He only took money the first two years so he could buy more books. That's it. He's like, Can you, are you guys paying me? Okay, I'll, I'll just leave money for some books and then I'm good. And he made sure he got the selected books he wanted. Once he had his collection set, he's okay, I don't need tuition anymore. I, don't, I mean, I don't need salary anymore. I'm good. So after that, he's just working for free. I highlighted this because it's very important when we come later on, inshallah. And the books he had, he didn't just keep them for decoration. And this is a very, very important point. Your books, they should not be for decoration. You should highlight them. You should mark them up in the margin. They should be, mess they should be totally messed up. Books are not for decoration. If you really love the book, buy two copies. Have one for a decoration, but have one that you keep. And you're always writing in it and scribbling and asking questions. Make sure you're involved in your, even the mushaf, you can use pencil and then erase later on, right? So books, books to, to show off and, and, but, and, and, to, and, and to, to make people impressed, but rather every book he had, he read and he would memorize them. So is that the end? If we stop there, if we stop right now, we would say, mashallah, this man is amazing. Great role model, great example for us, but there's more. There's the social aspect of Imam Nawawi. And this is the part that I hope, um, if you haven't heard before, inshallah, you hope you really enjoyed this. Imam Nawawi was a leader of the people. He wasn't just given the title Imam because he had lots of knowledge. He was given the title Imam because he stood up for people. And we're going to look at a few of the letters that he wrote. First off, Imam Nawawi, he was brave. And he lived by the hadith which we find in his book that from the Prophet ﷺ, where the Prophet ﷺ said, Adinu Nasiha. The religion is sincere advice. And he took that very seriously. It doesn't matter who's committing the harm or who's doing the wrong, they need to be advised. They need to be advised gently, they need to be advised softly, they need to be advised with love, and that's something that has to happen. And this is a great lesson for us. Some people say sometimes, you know what, I commit sins, I can't advise. If everyone takes that mentality, then who's going to give advice? We give advice while praying that we also improve. So Imam Nawawi, he lived during the time of a Sultan al Zahir. And this Sultan, this leader of the Muslims, he was a war hero. So you know war heroes, they come with a lot of credit, a lot of street credit. When there's a presidential election, if that president fought in Vietnam or fought in some war, all of a sudden people want, to, want him to win. He usually wins that, wins that election. So Imam Nawawi, uh, a Sultan of Zahir, he had fought and he had defeated the Mongols. And we can't go into the whole history, but we know the Mongols, when they came, it was terrifying. People thought the Mongols were who? Yajuj and Majuj. Because they're just wiping Muslims out left and right. They're like, that's it, the end is near. Apocalypse. So he was actually a, a, a big part of defeating the Mongols. So he had great credit with the people. But Imam Nawawi, he would give him advice when he saw that he did things that were wrong. And he would speak to him face to face. And he would meet him in the hall of justice. Every uh, Muslim empire, they have a hall. This picture here, this is actually the hall from uh, Medina de Zahra in, um, in Granada in Spain. Where the, where, the, where the sultan over there would be and he would meet people. So every, every emir, every, every, every uh, Muslim empire, there's a hall where guests are welcome and they have discussions. So he would meet him there face to face and he would give him advice. And he would also write letters to him and give him advice. And when there was a serious matter, the other scholars in Damascus, they would rally behind Imam Nawawi and they would make him write the letter and sign his name and then they would kind of sign their names below. So Imam Nawawi, he was the leader of the scholars as well, just so you know. So first off, there was an incident where Imam Nawawi, where, where the Sultan, 
he wanted to increase the taxes on the people. Sounds familiar? He wanted to increase the taxes on the people. And the taxes were already unbearable. And the taxes, when they were, when they were introduced to be raised, it was a time when there was a drought and people were, 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 were hungry and, they were, and they, were not, they were not well. So Imam Nawi, he writes a letter to the, to the Sultan. We can't go through the whole thing, I would have loved to, but I'll just pick out snippets. So he said, it is to be brought to your attention that during this year, the people of Sham, which is the general region of Syria, Palestine, Jordan today, Lebanon, the people of Sham are in very difficult circumstances and are very weak due to the lack of rain, high prices, lack of crops, death of grazing animals and other reasons. And you, as a ruler, you know that one must have sympathy for the rule and one must advise them for, the, for, and, and one must advise them for his welfare and their welfare. Verily, the, the religion is sincere advice. So he quotes the hadith, Adinu Nasiha. And he says, those serving the Sharia have written as a matter of advice to the Sultan in love for him. You see how he's writing? This is how you advise your brother. He says, in love for them are writing this letter. This is a letter reminding him to take care of the affairs of his citizens and be gentle towards them. There is no harm meant by this letter. Instead, it is a sincere advice and complete act of sympathy. It is a reminder to those of understanding. And it is spoken by pointing out the importance of being gentle with the rule. Then Allah will put in store for you a great reward. And then he goes on and he quotes ayat and ayat of the Quran about those who are the, the, the just ruler, how they will be on the day of judgment. So one can see from the letter of Imam Nawawi that he has no ill intention when he writes a letter. Usually when someone approaches a, a, a person in leadership, they just want to bring them down, they want to humiliate them. He takes a very gentle stance. He doesn't have any ill intention. And he doesn't exert his power. As a scholar in Damascus and as the lead scholar, he has lots of power. But he writes it just like a simpleton. He writes it in very simple words. He doesn't insult the Sultan in any way. He doesn't use any bad language. When it comes to politics, people think you have to use bad language. He didn't do that. And he didn't show, uh, he, but at the same time, um, he didn't show off in the letter. He didn't say, okay, this is who I am and, and proclaiming his, his power. He didn't do any of that. His only interest was the interest of the people and he conveyed his message in a clear and simple way so that the, the Sultan would understand. However, Imam Nawawi was a real man. And he knew that sometimes the soft way doesn't work. And there's a verse in the Quran, Surah Ra'ad, verse 17. This is a beautiful verse. This verse basically, Allah SWT is saying that he sends down water from the sky and, and it and creates a torrent basically in the ocean, a, ti a tide in the ocean, and a foam is formed. And then that foam, it, it's taken away to the sea. Similarly, or, or when it is burned with fire, a foam comes from it and it also removes the dirt. So Allah SWT is presenting a, a beautiful example for us of two ways that filth can be removed. One is water coming in and just gently taking it away. The other way is ore being burnt. And then that, 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 uh, that the, uh, the chemicals and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the dirty elements are removed this way. And then Allah ends the verse. This is how Allah SWT presents his examples. The scholars have explained that this verse is, is a very powerful verse showing that when it comes to da'wah, people can come like water on the body, just being cleansed and coming in, entering into Islam and entering into this fold of justice on their own. But those who want to fight, those who want to create problems, those who want to resist and be, and be enemies, then we're going to come back to them the same way. They're not going to, it's not, it's not you, know, we, you get slapped in the face, you turn the other cheek. That's not our, that's not our thing. If someone comes to you one way, you respond the same way and, and, and not more. You don't go, you don't go past the uh, limits. Uh, so Imam Nawawi, he presented these letters, he spoke to the Sultan very gently, but eventually the response of the Sultan was the opposite. He actually turns around and threatens the Imam and says, we're going to banish you. Or we're going to come after you if you try to stop us from raising the taxes. And then he throws out an excuse and he says that this is for jihad. How dare you stop me? This is for jihad. This is for protecting the believers. How can you say this thing? So the Sultan responds this way. And the Imam, he responds back. And this time he doesn't come with soft words. And this is a picture, by the way. Do you guys, have you guys seen this picture? It was on social media a couple days ago. This is a picture of a sister in Nigeria who fights to kill Boko Haram people. So Imam Nawawi, he writes. And he says, and again, I have to abbreviate here for, because of the time, but I wish I could read the whole letter. He said, as for threatening the citizens because of our advice and threatening a group of scholars, this is not what is expected from the justice and the calmness of the ruler. As for myself, threats do not harm me or mean anything to me. 
So what is he saying? He's saying, bring it, I don't care. Say whatever you want to say. He said, they will not keep me from advising the Sultan. Certainly, I believe that it is an obligatory, it is, it is obligatory upon me and upon others. The result of anything obligatory will be goodness and increase of good in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then again now, when he quotes him with verses, the first time he quoted, ayat inspiring to do good and to do just and, and to do the right thing. This time he comes with verses talking about punishment, talking about humiliation for those that transgress. And so he doesn't hold back. And so this second letter, it shows us that again, his concern is for Allah in the hereafter. He's not intimidated at all by the threats of the Sultan. All he cared about were the people. That was his number one chief concern. He also showed he's not going to bow down for any ruler just because they're in a position of authority. And again, he advised the ruler. He tried to inject some, some gentle words within the letter, but he stood his ground. And he's trying to motivate the, the ruler again to do the right thing, that you know, you know what's good for the people. And he says words of, of kindness that if you do what is right for the people, they will make dua for you. They will make dua for you. You do good for these hundreds of thousands of people, you have a hundred thousand people making dua for you instead of against you. It's in your interest to do what's right. He tries to appeal to him. Then a second incident happened. And the second incident was land being taken from people in Sham. Same thing happening today, unfortunately. There were some land that were captured by the Mongols. And through the efforts of, of, the, of, the, war, of the soldiers, they were able to reclaim that land. But the government was very greedy. So they hired a scholar, a puppet scholar, who happened to, happened to be Hanafi, by the way. They hired him, and he passed a fatwa that this land cannot be reclaimed without written proof. Although it was a tradition, of, it was an oral tradition. Land was passed down generation after generation after generation to people, to sons and daughters. And, they, and now they passed a fatwa, this is not enough, we need written proof, we need written documentation. And so the people who this land belonged to, they were unable to go to their land. Their land was just taken from them and absorbed by the government. And so Imam Nawawi, when this happened, he wrote a very harsh letter demanding the return of the land to the families who were undergoing the hardship. And the Sultan, he responded now with anger. And he, and he turned to his soldiers and he said, this guy, where does he work? He works in university? Take away his salary. And what happened? The soldiers came to him and said, um, he doesn't make any money. <laughs> this is a great lesson for us. This is a great lesson for us. In our life, we should try to make sure we're independent. Make sure that your risk, it's under your control completely. Don't be at the mercy of anyone. I know some brothers, they don't even take rides from people. We used to go to events back in the MSA days. They wouldn't take rides from anyone. They say, no, I'm going to take the bus. Brother, I have a car. No, no, I'm taking the bus home. It's okay. They don't want to be indebted to anyone. Lest that person come back later and say, hey, I used to drop you off all the time. What, you, you got to pay me back now. They don't want to be indebted to anyone. And that's a very smart way to actually live your life. So Imam Nawawi, uh, when, the, when, the, when the soldier said this, then the Sultan asked, well, how does he eat? If he doesn't make money. Well, he's trained his stomach to live off a glass of water. And they said that his father sends him food from the farm in Nawa. And when that food comes, then he eats something more substantial. He waits for his father to send the bread and send the fruits and the crops from his land because he knows it's 100% halal. And so there's no way to stop this man, this man Imam Nawawi. So the Sultan says, you know what, okay, if I can't hurt him that way, why don't I just kill him? Right? And he was asked, why don't you just kill him? And the Sultan, he says, this is the Sultan's words, he says, Wallahi, I thought about seizing him and having him killed, but then it was as if I saw a lion with his mouth open between me and him. And had I approached him, he would have attacked me. And this is the reality of what we read in the Quran. That if we fear Allah, then what will Allah do? He will put the fear of, of us in, in other people's hearts. If we truly fear Allah, then people will be scared of us. And this is an exact uh, uh, realization of, those, of, the, of the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Sultan couldn't even go near him. He admitted it. And he made it clear to many people, and it's come through many narrations, that the Sultan was scared of Imam Nawawi. Scared of a man that has no weapons, no wealth, no, nothing physical in this world, no army behind him. He's just terrified of him. And this is one of the amazing things about, one of the many, many amazing things of Imam Nawawi. So Imam Nawawi, he appeals to him that the people are starving. He starts, and he sends another letter now, and he starts by quoting over 11 verses, admonish, admonishing the, the ruler to do what is right, do what is just. He said the just people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're like members of light in the community, those who do justice. 
And he said the Muslims here, they have faced, uh, due to this taking over of the property, they have faced so many different harms that words can't even describe. So again, that eloquence in his, in his style of writing to really give the point that these people, I can't even describe what they're going through. He said, if you free them, Allah will free you from every dislike deed. For these people are the weak. Some of them are orphans, some of them poor, some of them weak, and some of them righteous. And it is through these people that you are aided, rescued, and provided for. So he said, because of these people in the community, that's why you have the status that you do. And he said to him, rescue the Muslims, and Allah will rescue you. And if you do this, as mentioned before, the citizens, they will pray for you. The, the Sultan again, he gets angry. And now he starts collecting the scholars and putting pressure on them. And he gets all of the scholars to sign a fatwa, to increase the taxes, so that he can go and wage his war against the Mongols. And then this, the Sultan says, has anyone not signed? Who do you think didn't sign? Imam Nawawi didn't sign. And so Imam Nawawi, he sends a final response to the Sultan. And I think we're going to be right on time, inshallah. And now he calls him out. And he had this information all along, but now is when he brings it out. And he says, I know that you used to be a slave of the Amir Bandukar, and that you did not have any wealth. Then Allah bestowed his bounty upon you, and you became the ruler. And I have heard that you have 1,000 male slaves, and each of them, their horses have a golden girth. The girth is, is below the saddle, the string basically, it's golden. You have 1,000 male slaves, and each of them, their horses have a golden girth. And you also have 200 slave girls, and each of them wearing gold jewelry. If you spend all of that, and you leave your slaves with normal straps instead of golden girths, and if you leave your slave girls with their clothing and no jewelry, then I will give you a fatwa that you can take the money from the people. This is Imam Nawawi. Imam Nawawi was the Malcolm X of his time. He spoke with eloquence. He spoke with power. And he wasn't scared to speak to the rulers that were corrupt. Imam Nawawi is an amazing man for us to follow. He is, definitely, he is certainly a legend. He was a defender of the masses. He was a defender of the scholars. When the scholars needed help, they would turn to him and he would defend them. And while all this was going on, they were still trying to defend him, but they didn't have the power. Imam Nawawi, as we mentioned before, before, he was a prolific writer. He was an amazing speaker. I mean, if he, if, he, if he had just written the books alone, we would say, this man is amazing. But he didn't just do that. He was also a man for the people fighting for them, speaking for them. And he also objected against all the innovations of the time that was happening. It wasn't, it was, it was during this time that, you know, grave worship and bowing to sheikhs, it was all happening. And he spoke out against all this. He said, this is not from the sunnah. We couldn't mention it before in detail, but Part of his methodology was, when he saw many different opinions, he would always go back to the early generation. And this is why his opinions are taken over others. And so Imam al nawawi eventually, he was banished from Damascus. And the Sultan was able to exert power and have, him, and have him forcefully removed. And when he was forced to remove, he took some time to visit his teachers, to visit his friends, to say salams and give respects to them. And on the way home, he stopped in Jerusalem, he prayed in Quds, and then he went back to his home in Nawa. And he died on the 24th of Rajab, 676, at the age of 44. 44 years old, and he accomplished all of these things. Those who are still under that age, what are you going to do by the time you're 44? What influence are you going to have in your community? Imam Nawawi, to summarize his life, a great scholar, Ibn Farah, he said that the Sheikh, he had reached in the top of three areas. Every one of these areas, if you had the ability, if, if you had to travel on a camel to get to accomplish that, you would have done it. Meaning, if, if, you could, if, if it was just a simple, if, if, uh, meaning if, so, if, if these levels are so important, you would do anything to get to them. But he accomplished three things in his life. One was he reached a level in knowledge that no one else reached at his time. And the reason why we still talk about him. Two is that he reached a level of asceticism where he was not attached to this world. And there are some people, they're just known for their asceticism. When you read the classic, you know, classic works on fiqh, like for example, the works of uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, and when he would write a fatwa, he would have different people in his, in his think tank. He would have people that are scholars in hadith, people that are scholars in Quran, people that are scholars in language. 
and you have a person who is an ascetic, a person who is not attached to the dunya, so they can chime in. So that was like a skill set by itself. This man, I, just, I know him, he's a man who's not, whose heart is not attached to this dunya. Imam Nawawi, he attained that level as well. And then third, he attained the level of ordering the good and forbidding the evil. Whereas we say, Amr bin Maruf, wa nahi al bunkar. He truly did it to the, to, to the letter. And so Imam Nawawi, he's an inspiration for us that we should try to work towards these goals and of course many other things. But we should seek knowledge with passion and with love. We should really be engrossed in seeking knowledge. Nowadays, you can become a master of anything. We have YouTube, we have Google, you can become a master of anything. Whatever you want to do, you can find a hundred videos telling you how to do it. You want to build a deck or you want to know how to set up a network like this, you can find a YouTube video to teach you how to do it. The knowledge is at our fingertips and yet, you know, we have, we, our standard is still so low. And it shows from, and that comes back to our intention. If your intention is to elevate your, your family and your community and to be of service to them, then Allah will bless you with that knowledge. So we have to seek knowledge with passion and with love. It has to be a labor of love. We should invest in knowledge. You know, if you have a good job, you should dedicate a good amount of money per month to hire a private tutor. This is the way. You have to hire a private tutor, you have to have someone who's, who you're under the tutelage of and you can learn from. You should be heavily invested in seeking knowledge. That's the most important thing for you to invest in for you and for your family. Number two, we have to seek to have a direct personal relationship with our Rabb. There is no barakah in our life without a personal relationship with our Rabb. And Alhamdulillah, Ramadan is right around the corner. And this is our opportunity to improve in our relationship with our Rabb. And this is one of the du'as we should make throughout this month that we have that constant connection. And of course, that only comes through an understanding and a relationship with the Qur'an itself. And then we should try to be leaders to the best of our ability. We live here in Queens, there's lots of good work to be done. There's lots of service to be done in our community. Some of the worst um, neighborhoods in New York State, they're right here in Queens, the far Rockaways. There's so much good that can be done in our own neighborhood. We have to be a part of that as well. And so I close with this, that Imam Nawawi, he was truly an amazing, amazing man. He was a renaissance man in the true essence of the word. He's a, he's a name that should be, truly be a household name. You should make sure that your children all have their own copies of the 40 hadith of Imam Nawawi. And it's very important that, and I wanted to say this in the beginning, that when we study scholars, we should really look to the scholars of the past because they, you, can, you can really be sure that they, that, they, that they died on a good note. They, the person who's living, you don't know how they're going to end. But this is why we go back to the people of the past because when they, when they die, their, their book is sealed and now we can do a full analysis and see what they were truly about. So Imam Nawawi is one of those great people. I encourage you all, make sure that you work actively to memorize the 40 hadith. There's many, many very short hadith in this book. Your children can soak them up like sponges and make sure they're connected to them. And of course, Riyadh al-Salihin should, should be a book that we're very familiar with as well. So inshallah, we ask Allah Taala to increase us in knowledge. We ask Allah Taala to bless the youth in this community so we, that there can rise many Imam Nawawi's from amongst them. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر